Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, we're going to begin looking more closely at Islam this evening and uh, for at least the next couple of presentations. They're one of the most important arguments to identify Islam here at the end of the world. Um, it was found in the triple application of prophecy. And when we look closely at prophecy, we see that the Lord often repeats prophecies three times. In doing so, he establishes a, a pattern. Within that pattern of these triple applications, there are certain internal rules. And one of the easiest triple applications to visualize and come to understand how they are governed is the three Elijahs. And we spend a lot of time on the three Elijahs and draw a lot of important lessons from the three Elijahs. But I'm not going to try to draw the lessons from the three Elijah. I'm simply going to start with this in order to show how triple application of prophecy works. And once I put that in place, then we'll go to the three woes of Revelation, which are the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet, in order to try to understand the role of Islam in Bible prophecy. But we know that there was, let me explain some rules first. When a prophecy is repeated three times in the Bible, you will find that the first two times that it is fulfilled, the characteristics of those two fulfillments, when combined, will identify the characteristics of the third and final fulfillment. There are three Elijahs in Bible prophecy. The first Elijah um, we're familiar with, and then the Seventh-day Adventists, we know that the last promise in the Old Testament, in the Malachi, is a promise that we, the Lord would send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And during the history of Christ, the Jews um, were guessing whether um, John the Baptist was Elijah or not, and, and Christ plainly identified John the Baptist as the Elijah to come. But John the Baptist was not the Elijah that was promised to appear before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Prophetically, when Christ was here on earth, that was the great day of the Lord in Bible prophecy. But the great and terrible day of the Lord is identified in Malachi is the end of the world, um, leading up, the events leading up to the second coming of Christ. So what I'm saying is that the first Elijah is illustrated here. I'll explain this this symbolism up here in a moment. And this E2 represents Elijah the second, which is John the Baptist. Now, in a triple application of prophecy, and there are there are several that we could point to. One of the things that you will find in these particular prophecies in the Bible is that they always teach you something about Rome. Okay? And in the first Elijah, what we are taught about Rome is that. The enemy of Elijah was threefold. It was Jezebel. This is Jezebel, an impure woman. And she was married to King Ahab. This is the king. And she was directing or controlling the prophets of Baal. And this, this triple wavy line represents the prophets of Baal. And it's easy to see in the story of Elijah, and if we remember that all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world that Elijah is representing God's people at the end of the world that have to deal with the threefold power of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, the papacy, the United Nations, and the United States. In the story of Elijah, the woman in Bible prophecy represents an impure church, and Jezebel was not supposed to be married to Ahab. And Ahab the king represents a civil power. A king is a kingdom. It's a civil power. It's worth noting, although we are not dealing with this at this point, that Ahab was a king of the ten northern tribes. Um, and this is a this also contributes to 
identifying who the ten kings of Revelation 17 are when we get to the end. The ten kings, you remember Revelation 17, the angel comes to John at the beginning of chapter 17 and says, I have come to show you the judgment of the great whore who has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. And in Revelation 17, those kings are portrayed as ten kings. The great whore is the papacy. And in the church of Thyatira, um, in Revelation um, chapter 2, the papacy is symbolized by Jezebel. Jezebel comes into a church state relationship. The papacy comes into a church state relationship at the end of the world. But there is a deceiving power at the end of the world that forces the world to accept this relationship. Um, and you'll notice that in the story of Elijah, the prophets of Baal danced around the offering all, all day long. So this the third power, one's a king, one's an impure woman. And the third is a deceiving power. It does the dance of deception. Are you with me? Yes. In the second Elijah, he had to deal with the same threefold power. The second Elijah was John the Baptist. He had to deal with Herodias, an impure woman that was not supposed to be married to Ahab, a civil power. Once again, representing the combination of church and state. And remember what John the Baptist said to Herod is you're not supposed to be married to her because she is your brother's wife. And Ahab wasn't supposed to be married to Jezebel because Ahab was a Jew and Jezebel was a heathen. And in this story, it was Herodias' daughter Salome that danced and did the dance of deception that uh, deceived Herod. And you see... You see in, in these stories that there is a deception that's accomplished against the civil power in, in both cases. When, when Ahab ran back to Jezebel and said, you would not believe what happened at Mount Carmel today. Um, Elijah's God is the true God. He actually brought fire down out of heaven. Ahab did not expect Jezebel to say, well, Elijah's going to be dead by tomorrow. He thought Jezebel would be converted by that experience. He had been deceived to the intentions and the motives of Jezebel. And the same with, with Herod. Uh, when Salome had did her dance of deception, and he says, up to half my kingdom I will give you for that wonderful dance, Herod did not expect Salome to say that what she wanted for the dance was John the Baptist's head in the charger. So in both these stories, you see that in the testing time of Carmel, um, which the testing time of Carmel takes place at the end of the world, that the civil power, which is the dragon power at the end of the world, will be deceived about the motivations of Jezebel and Herodias, the motivations of the papacy, and the power that deceives them does the dance of deception, whether it's the prophets of Baal dancing around their offering all day long, or Salome doing the dance of deception, Pointing forward to Revelation 13, the teacher of the United States is going to deceive the whole world into accepting an image of the beast. Sister White identifies the image of the beast as the combination of church and state, with the church in control of the relationship. The United States, at the end of the world, is going to force the world to accept the combination of church and state that is represented in Revelation 17 as taking place between the whore, as Revelation 17 identifies her, uh, the papacy, and the ten kings, which we're not dealing with Revelation 17, but the ten kings is the United Nations, it is the dragon power. If you haven't looked at, at that thought before, a good place to start is Testimonies to Ministers, page 38, where Sister White says, kings, governors, and rulers have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war against the saints. Um, so Sister White identifies the dragon at the end of the world as a group of politicians, kings, governors, and rulers. And there's many more arguments to identify this as the United Nations. But they are the state. This is the church. The United States is the deceiving power. And, but what I want you to see, and for some of you that came in just a little bit late, what we're saying here is that in Bible prophecy, 
there are prophecies that are repeated three times, and they have an internal rule connected with them. It's not accident that they're repeated three times. It was Christ's <coughs> plan to, to govern prophecy upon this triple application. And there's an internal rule that he's established with him within these triple applications. When you take the characteristics of the first fulfillment of the prophecy, Elijah the first being Elijah, and you combine it with the second fulfillment of the prophecy, Elijah the second, John the Baptist, when you combine the prophetic characteristics of these two, E1 plus E2, you will establish and identify equal the characteristics of Elijah the third. And this is, we understand this from Revelation 7. When, when Revelation 6, the, the final verse of Revelation 6 raises the question, who is going to be able to stand in the day, day of the Lord's wrath? Revelation 17 answers that question. And it says 144,000 in the great multitude. And when you take Elijah the first and Elijah the second and combine them, obviously Elijah represents God's people at the end of the world. But there's two classes. Elijah never died. He went to heaven in a, in a chariot, representing 144,000 that never died. John the Baptist's head was chopped out and off. And if you read Revelation 20, verse 4, where those that are killed during the Sunday law testing time, you'll notice that it says that the way that they are killed is their head is chopped off. And I don't believe that all the martyrs during the Sunday law testing time are going to lose their head. I think it's saying that those people that are martyrs during that testing time have been symbolically represented by John the Baptist, the second Elijah. When these two are combined, they're illustrating God's people at the end of the world. If all of us are faithful in this room, then in theory some of us have the potential of living till the return of the Lord, and some of us, even if we're faithful, would probably get laid to rest. So, a triple application prophecy is defined. I'll give you I'll give you just a couple more so you you can see it, and then we'll move into our point of reference tonight. There are three Romes. Pagan Rome, you take the characteristics of pagan Rome and you combine it with the characteristics of papal Rome, you will establish the characteristics of modern Rome. And there are important truths to, to establish from combining the three Romes. I'll give you one that is, some of them are easy. The, head of, the title of the head of pagan Rome was Pontifus Maximus. The title of the head of papal Rome was Pontifus Maximus, and the title of modern Rome will be Pontifus Maximus. Pagan Rome was a persecuting power. Papal Rome was a persecuting power. Modern Rome will be a persecuting power. This seems kind of simplistic, but it's an important rule. The first two times the prophecy is fulfilled is identifying and establishing the third time the prophecy is fulfilled. And when it comes to the three Romes, I'll, I'll give you there are several characteristics of the Rome. I've, of Rome's. I've never, I just mentioned two, I'll mention one more and then we'll move away from it. Um, how many are you, how many uh, of you understand that there is a time prophecy in the Bible about how long papal Rome would rule the world? Hopefully every hand in this room goes up, right? How long was papal Rome going to rule the world? 1260 years. years. How many of you understand there was a time prophecy in the Bible that identified how long pagan Rome would rule the world? I raise your hands high. See, there's less of us that understand that, but if you turn very quickly to Daniel 11, 24, and I, I, I will not spend a great deal of time on this because it's way off subject, but in Daniel 11, 24, the subject of verse 24 is pagan Rome. And in the very last phrase of verse 24 of Daniel 11, it says, He, pagan Rome, shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And in the book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, which Sister White says every Seventh-day Adventist should own, because she says that we should be giving that book out to our neighbors. And she also says that that book is God's helping hand. Uriah Smith will identify, as I am identifying in that book, that the last part of this verse, when it says he, he'll say that's pagan Rome, and then he deals with the Hebrew of the word there, and he says it is better stated that it's saying that pagan Rome 
will broadcast its devices from its stronghold, from its stronghold. The city of Rome was its stronghold for a time, and he will tell you that time in Bible prophecy is how long? A year, and how many days are in a year? 60. So this is a time prophecy on how long pagan Rome would rule the world supremely. And in Daniel 8, 9, and Daniel 11, 16, and 17, we have two passages, Daniel 8, 9, and Daniel 11, 16, and 17, that teach that before pagan Rome took control of the world supremely, it had to conquer three geographical areas. Daniel 8, 9 identifies it as the east, the south, and the pleasant land. Before pagan Rome could take control of the world, it had to conquer Syria, Israel, and Egypt. He conquered the third of those powers at the Battle of Actium, which is one of the most famous naval battles in ancient history. And it conquered Egypt in the year 31 BC, and it ruled the world supremely for 360 years until in the year 330, Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople. At that point, the Roman Empire began to crumble. And some of you know this trick question, don't answer. I want them to think it through. Why did the city, why was it that pagan Rome began to crumble after the year 330? The, there's the first answer we've just explained. There was a time prophecy saying that it would rule the world for 360 years. That began in 31 BC, and that ended in the year 330, so the time prophecy was fulfilled. But what's the reason, the other reason, that Rome began to crumble after the year 330. Sunday law. In the year 321, the first Sunday law was passed, and the principle is national apostasy is followed by national ruin. And after the year 330, then the trumpets of revelation began to blow, and piece by piece, the Roman Empire is taken apart. By the year 476, Western Rome is gone. Western Rome has disintegrated into the Ten Kingdoms of Daniel 7 that we're so familiar with. And what accomplished that was the first four trumpets of Revelation. Uh, in any case, before pagan Rome could rule the world supremely, in, you know, in fulfillment of this time prophecy, it had to conquer three geographical areas, Syria, Israel, and Egypt. Before papal Rome could rule the world supremely, it had to overcome three geographical areas, the Hirolos, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And when it conquered the third, the Ostrogoths in 538, it ruled the world supremely. This is a triple application of prophecy. If pagan Rome had to conquer three geographical areas before it took control of the world, and if papal Rome had to conquer three geographical areas before it took control of the world, then the king of the north in Daniel 11, which is modern Rome, will have to conquer three geographical areas. And in Daniel 11, 40 to 43, those geographical areas are represented as the King of the South, the Glorious Land, and Egypt. Based upon this triple application of prophecy, it tells you that whoever the King of the South, the Glorious Land, and Egypt are, they have to be geographical areas. But they have to be, because in the triple application of prophecy, the first two times a prophecy is fulfilled will identify the characteristics of the third fulfillment. Another one, just to, just to bring it to a conclusion before we look at the three woes. Uh, some of you came in just a little bit late. We're, we're looking at a triple application of prophecy and how, how those prophecies are governed. And we started with Elijah. The characteristics of the first fulfillment of the prophecy combined with the characteristics of the second fulfillment will establish and identify the final fulfillment of that prophecy. One that is in the very message that we are to proclaim is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Have you ever wondered why when that expression is in God's word in the second and fourth angels message and other places in the scriptures, why doesn't it just say Babylon is fallen? I believe it's because it is our message. And our message is Babylon is fallen and is fallen. And if you take the characteristics of the first fall of Babylon in the story of Nimrod and Babel, and you combine it with the characteristics of the fall of Babylon with Belshazzar in chapter 5 of Daniel, you will establish 
the characteristics of the final fall of Babylon in Christ knew that our message at the end of the world would have to do with identifying the fall of Babylon, and he knew that he had designed triple application of prophecy to clarify these truths. So he purposely makes the message, Babylon is fallen with Nimrod, he is fallen with Belshazzar, in order to describe the fall of modern Babylon. There are other triple applications of prophecy, but what we want to look at tonight, as we get back to our repetition of history of the Millerites, is the last three trumpets in Revelation. And we have a couple questions that have already arisen that this study will, will raise to the fourth of our tension. When we do this study, this is where we get the question, wasn't it George Bush that brought down the Twin Towers on 9-11? So we're, we're heading towards trying to give you um, how the answer on how we understand that. But if you go to Revelation chapter 8, the pioneers of Adventism, and I would just challenge you on this to crack open um, Daniel the prophet by Haskell, or Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, or get on the pioneer CD-ROM, and you will find that the pioneers understood that the seven churches of Revelation in chapter 2 and 3 was describing the history of the Christian church from the time period of the apostles until the end of the world. And they also understood that the seals that were opened, the seven seals, were the, the same history. They were operating upon the, the rule of repeat and enlarge. The seven churches described the history from the Christian church the apostles to the end of the world, and then the seven seals are repeating and enlarging upon that history. The first seal, the white horse, is the church of Ephesus. The second seal, the red horse, is the church of Smyrna, down the line. So when you come to chapter 8, um, and you get to the trumpets, the trumpets are also operating upon the principle of repeat and enlarge, but the trumpets, the pioneers, identified as the historical forces that bring down Rome. And the Rome at the beginning of this history that is set forth with the churches and the seals is pagan Rome. Pagan Rome is the, the Rome that's in power at the, during the time period of the Apostle, during the time period of Ephesus. And pagan Rome was going to reach a point where it passes the Sunday Law in the year 321, and in the year 330, the kingdom is going to be divided between east and west when Constantine moved to the capital, and then it begins to crumble. And this crumbling and disintegration of paganism is preparing the way for the next Rome, papal Rome. So the, the churches, the seals, and the trumpets are operating upon the principle of repeat and enlarge, but the trumpets do not come into that history until after pagan Rome has did its work of passing the, country, the Sunday law. They, they don't, the first trumpet doesn't correspond with the first church and the first seal. The first trumpet uh, comes in in the church of Pergamos time period. And in chapter 8 of Revelation, you will see um, the first trumpet there in, in verse 7. And as I've said, I want to repeat it again, the pioneer understanding. And brothers and sisters, in the first night when we handed out the five endorsements of the message of 1840 to 1844, along with the two endorsements of those charts, um, correctly understood, that's seven endorsements right there in that first handout where Sister White is endorsing the pioneer understanding of the trumpet. You can see it represented on both those charts. So when I'm saying the pioneer understanding of the trumpets is that they are representing the historical forces that bring down Rome, that's foundational to Adventism as part of the black platform that we're supposed to stand on if we're going to understand end time Bible prophecy. And the first trumpet there in verse 6 of Revelation 8 is Alaric. Um, one of the barbarians that came out of northern Europe. The second trumpet in verse 8 is Genseric. 
the Vandals out of northern Africa. The third trumpet in verse 10, Attila the Hunt. And the fourth trumpet is Eliezer, the barbarian also. By these four trumpets, accomplish what is identified in Daniel chapter 7. Remember that pagan Rome in Daniel chapter 7 is going to disintegrate into ten kingdoms. The work of these four trumpets in bringing down and attacking and taking Rome apart by the year 476 from the work of these four trumpets, uh, the ten kingdoms are in existence and uh, western Rome is gone by 476. Um, there isn't an Italian that's ruling from Rome. It's barbarians onward that are ruling the city of Rome. The city of Rome was the, the point that these forces were attacking for. So in verse 13, after the first four trumpets, in verse 13 of chapter 8, it says, And I beheld, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, by the reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. So the, the last three trumpets are called three woes. And prophecy is purposely making that distinction. And what I'm suggesting here is that the three row, woes are governed under the understanding of a triple application of prophecy. And if this is so, and I believe that it is, I believe it sheds too much strong arguments to support in time Bible prophecy to doubt that it's so. So the conclusions that you draw from this tri triple application of prophecy are so sound that they're beyond being categorized as speculation. But if that is so, and it is when we look at the characteristics of the first two trumpets, or the first two woe trumpets, the fifth and sixth trumpet, we will establish the characteristics of the third and final trumpet. Now, though, when I do this, I tell you out front that there are characteristics in the first woe and in the second woe that I'm not going to point out at this time. I'm not disregarding them because they, they destroy what I'm trying to teach. They, that what I'm leaving out strengthens what I'm trying to teach. But I want you to see, I want you to see how it works first, and then we will go back and add some things to it. So if you're wondering why I'm leaving some of the components of the first woe out of the presentation here and out of the second woe, I promise. As much as I understand, I will come back to it. But the, the fifth trumpet in chapter 9 that goes from verses 1 through 12 is describing, by the way, if you notice the first four trumpets, there's historical figures that are associated with it. Um, Alaric, James Eric, Attila the Hun, Odiacer. And the fifth trumpet, the historical figure that's associated with the fifth trumpet is Muhammad. This is the when when Islam comes into history, and the pioneers understood that the fifth trumpet, the first woe, was identifying Islam. And so we'll put that up there. First woe <coughs> is Islam. And Muhammad is the historical figure associated with it. And but the Islam in the first woe, verses one through twelve, is the Islam that began with Muhammad in Arabia, I point that out because the Islam of the second wall is going to be the Islam dynasty in what we call today Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. And it's actually two cultures, so there is a little bit of difference there between the first and second wall. The Islam of the first wall is Arabia, the Islam of the second wall will identify as Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. Um, the the what's being described in the first woe by the identification of Islam is the work of Islam in, in attacking the armies of Rome. Um, that's, that's what the pioneers correctly identify the trumpets as. They're the historical forces that bring down Rome. So in the first woe, um, what's being described is Islam attacking the armies of Rome. 
And in the passage, and I, I realize we're not reading the passage, I'm just pulling it out, um, but you can read the passage and then go into Thoughts on John and Revelation by Uriah Smith, and you will see that I'm giving an accurate representation of the pioneer understanding. In chapter 9, um, the mode of warfare of Islam is identified. They, did, they didn't line up one line after another in red coats like the British and the French used to do. Islam in its history would come up over the sand dune on their horse and, and attack and keep moving and go over the other sand dune. They strike suddenly and unexpectedly. That was their method of warfare. Now, I'm telling you, there are more characteristics of the first woe that we will deal with, but this is enough to make our point. I'm not, and once we add these other characteristics in later, they will not change the triple application of prophecy that we are identifying. They'll only strengthen it. The second woe, which begins in verse 13, and let me ask you a question, and for those of you that know the answer, refrain. The second woe that begins in verse 13, when does it end? No, when in Revelation does it end? Look at Revelation 11, verse 14. Revelation 11, verse 14 says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So I, I just want to put that in our mind because we will deal with that this evening, no doubt. That the first woe begins in verse 1 of chapter 9 and goes to verse 12. The second woe begins in verse 13, and it's marked as concluding in chapter 11, verse 14. Okay, so second woe goes a bit farther than the first woe. But the pioneers will tell you correctly that the second woe is Islam, but it's the Islam of what we call today Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, not Arabia. But once again, the second woe, what they're doing is attacking the armies of Rome. And they would strike suddenly and unexpectedly, this SMU is suddenly and unexpectedly, but in the first world, let me back up to the first world, there is a time prophecy in the first world of 150 years that began at a specific battle on July 27, 1299. All this information um, you can find in the Rise of this book. The 150 year time period of the, of the first world began on July 27, 1299, 1299, 1299, and it ended on July 27, 1449. There is a time prophecy in the second world, which is the very foundation of Adventism in some respect, and the time prophecy in the second world is in verse 14 and 15. Let's, let's read this. We're in chapter 9. It says, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. The time prophecy in the first woe that began on July 27, 1299, went for 150 years, and when it concluded on July 27, 1449, this time prophecy of a day a month, an hour, and a year began, and using the year-day principle, that adds up to 391 years and 15 days, and it concludes on August 11th, 1840. So, the start, if you want to mark the beginning of the second woe, you can mark it on July 27th, 1449, and what would it be? Four years later, roughly, in the year 1453, Islam attacks Constantinople, and for it was the first time in history 
when gunpowder was used. So when it comes to the second woe, the method of warfare of Islam in the second woe is identical to the method of warfare in the first woe. It was Islam attacking the armies of Rome and they would strike suddenly and unexpectedly. But in the second woe, as they struck suddenly and unexpectedly, they also used explosives. They're all, whether the first woe or the second woe, um, they were controlled by, their power was in their tail. Look at verse 10 of Isaiah, or of Revelation 9. It says, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, um, and their power was to hurt men five months. And so if we identify what the tails are, if you go to Isaiah 9, 15, Isaiah 9, 15 says, The ancient honor and honorable, he is the head. The prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. What, what, we are under, what the pioneers understood, what we understand from this, is that these Islamic warriors were directed and controlled by their religious leaders from behind the scenes. This is Islamic control and directed today. So, when it comes to a triple application of prophecy, and I've told you, I've left some of the characteristics out of both of these, but this is enough to make the point that we want to make here. A triple application of prophecy in the Bible, when you have a prophecy that's repeated three times, and it is not I that made a distinction between the last three trumpets and the first fourth trumpet. It was verse 13 of Revelation 8 that says the last three trumpets of the seven are woes. So you have three woes, you have Bible prophecy telling you to understand these three woes the way all prophecy that's repeated three times in the Bible is understood, and that is that the first two times that it's fulfilled, the characteristics of the first fulfillment combined with the characteristics of the second fulfillment will establish the characteristics of the third fulfillment. Therefore, when the third woe arrives in history, it will be Islam. But it won't just be Islam in Arabia and Turkey when they're brought together. It's going to be worldwide Islam, the entire Islamic world. And what will they do when the third woe arrives in history? They will attack the armies of Rome. And at the end of the world, who's the armies of Rome? What's the power in Revelation 13 that forces the world to receive the mark of the beast? And they use two strengths to do so. Economic strength. You can't buy or sell if you don't have the mark of the beast. And military strength. You're put to death if you don't have the mark of the beast. The military, the army of Rome at the end of the world is the United States. So when the third woe comes into history, it will be worldwide Islam attacking the United States, and their mode of warfare will be that they strike suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives. Of course, you can't recognize that. You can't recognize that and identify that if you don't maintain and accept the pioneer understanding of the trumpets that are represented on that chart. You can't reach that conclusion if you reject that, because if you were the brothers and sisters, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has rejected that. I've got, a, I've got emails from the Biblical Research Institute that says we no longer accept that the fifth and sixth trumpet is Islam. And if you don't accept that the fifth and sixth trumpet is Islam, then you can't make a biblical argument that the seventh trumpet is Islam. But, pray tell what do they say it is? They say the theologians have many ideas. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but, but if you do accept the pioneer understanding, if you're going to stand on the foundation, then you are forced to identify the third woe in agreement with the testimony of the first and second woe. So what I'm saying to you 
is that on September 11, 2001, worldwide Islam struck the armies of Rome suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives, and the third world began in history. Now, I left one component out that I should have put in there. Uh, if you read carefully Revelation 9, it will tell you that in the first woe, Islam was to hurt the armies of Rome for 150 years. But in the second woe, Islam would kill the armies of Rome. So when you bring those together in the third woe, you will find that Islam will first hurt the armies of Rome and then participate in the final resolution of the threefold feast of Revelation 16, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. When you look at that closely, what I'm saying is, is that there will be a two-step attack by Islam on the armies of Rome, and the first attack will bring about the conditions that bring the Son of God into history. And then after that, you will see modern Babylon brought down. Now, when I say that it was Islam that attacked the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001, particularly in a congregation like this, who I am familiar some of the, with some of the other speakers that come through here, I know that you're saying to yourself, in the most friendly, Christ-like fashion, Brother Kissinger, don't you know that it was George Bush and the Jesuits that did 9-11? I know you're saying that, and that's the question and answer that we want to try to resolve here this evening. Um, no, I don't know that. I don't know that. Um, I, I personally, I'm answering that question, I personally turned away from conspiracy theories on purpose about six or seven years ago and determined that for me I have to come to understand the end time Bible prophecy from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy first and then go to the outside information second and if the Bible and the spirit of prophecy doesn't bring the outside information and I treat the outside information under the context of Isaiah on chapter 8 who said to the law and the testament to speak out according to this word there is no light in them so, so but, but we're still going to deal with it, okay? We're still going to deal with it. For those of you that have the conviction that September 11, 2001 was not Islam, it was George Bush and the Jesuits, <coughs> first let me point out one more prophetic thing before we try to give you a um, biblical answer for that. When Islam attacked on 9-11, the two places that were struck was the Pentagon and the Twin Towers, all right? Now, I, I get in trouble, and I, I really don't push this. I, I get in trouble when I say this. I say, you know, it's is it a coincidence? I mean, is it beyond the ability of Christ to control the production of books in the Bible or spirit of prophecy books? Is it beyond his ability that it's in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, where you just you see what went on in New York. I mean, I, we can't put that into the mix, but it is there. And is it beyond his ability to identify for us in chapter nine of Revelation, verse eleven? It says, "And the king, and they had a king over them." And I would submit to you that the king over Islam of the first, second, and third woe um, is the same king. It says it had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. And, but in the Greek tongue, half his name, Apollyon, the destroyer, <coughs> here in 9-11 is where you see the destruction identified. But when the destruction hit on 9-11, it hit the economic symbol of the United States and the military symbol of the United States. And the symbol of the United States in Bible prophecy in Revelation 13, its strength at the end of the world is economic and military. Because if you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. And if you don't have the mark of the beast, you're put to death. The two symbols of the United States in end-time Bible prophecy, as it gets to the point where it's going to force the whole world to receive the mark of the beast, is economic and military. So it seems more than a coincidence that that's the two symbols that were struck 
on 9-11, it seems to me that the Lord was trying to tell us we need to understand that this has a prophetic significance. So how do we deal with all the information that says it's the globalists? Do you mind if I categorize the Jesuits and George Bush and the CIA as globalists? How do we deal with all the information that it was the globalists that were behind that? Well, here's how you deal with that if, if you want to maintain the pioneer position. The pioneers taught that the trumpets represent the historical forces that bring down Rome. The first four trumpets brought down Western Rome by the year 476. The first trumpet, at the, at the end of the first trumpet, the beginning of the second trumpet, the last emperor of Eastern Rome is removed. And Eastern Rome comes down in the history of the second world. And in the history of the second world, Papal Rome receives its deadly wound. So in the history of the trumpets, Western Rome, Eastern Rome, Papal Rome are all brought down. But in the history of the second world, which if we were going to use a triple application of prophecy, this would be one of the characteristics of the second world that you would combine with the first in order to identify the characteristics of the third. Okay? In the history of the second world, it does not end in 1840 at the end of the 391-year time prophecy. It doesn't, the testimony in Revelation doesn't end. It ends in Revelation 11, verse 14. And we have always correctly understood that Revelation 11 is identifying the French Revolution. And the French Revolution is what produced uh, the situation that Napoleon brought the deadly wound to the papacy. Okay. And Napoleon, France, is, a, is the dragon power. In, in Daniel chapter 7, pagan Rome is identified. In Revelation 12, pagan Rome is identified as um, attempting to kill Christ at his birth, and participating in his crucifixion. The dragon in Revelation 12, Revelation 12 says it's Satan. But in the great controversy, when Sister White is commenting on Revelation 12, she says the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan. But in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. Pagan Rome was the dragon power. So in, Reve in Daniel 7, Pagan Rome was the dragon power, and when it disintegrated into ten kingdoms, those ten kingdoms were part of the dragon power. Okay? They weren't the beast, they weren't the false prophets, they were the dragon power. And one of those ten kingdoms was France. And France is the power that delivered the deadly wound. But France, as the historical force that delivered the deadly wound, it did so in the history of the Second World. So the second woe contains the evidence of the work of Islam bringing down Eastern Rome in 1453 when Constantinople was destroyed. But it also contains the history of Western Rome, France, the dragon power, giving the papacy the deadly wound. Therefore, therefore, and I may have said too much for the public of law, therefore, when it comes to a triple application of prophecy, when you take the characteristics of the first world and you combine it with the characteristics of the second world, you're identifying the characteristics of the third world. And one of the characteristics that you should expect to find when the third world arrives in history is that not only Islam would be involved in the work of, of bringing down Rome and attacking the armies of Rome, but the dragon power is in that history too. So if you must identify 9-11, as the dragon power, as George Bush and the globalists and the Jesuits, it's covered by the pioneer understanding of the woes. The second world con contains the activities of both the dragon power, France, and Islam. But I think the evidence, the prophetic evidence, <coughs> comes down strongly that it was, it was everyone on those planes were Muslims. But brothers and sisters, that point is not really one that that we should argue about. Let me put one more thought in the mix here on this to make sure, or hopefully make sure you understand my point. 
Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee, unto thee the judgment of the great whore that setteth upon many waters. The great whore here, um, if you get a, a dictionary that was published before 1950, and you look up Scarlet Woman, and this great whore in Revelation 17 is portrayed as being in Scarlet. If we get a, go to a used bookstore here in town, get a dictionary that was published before 1950, and look up the word Scarlet Woman, it will tell you the Roman Catholic Church in allusion to Revelation 17. Before 1950, 1950, everyone knew that the whore of Revelation 17 was the Catholic Church. All right, Everyone knew it, it was just out in the open. Um, but she sits upon many waters, and the Catholic Church is modern Babylon. And Babylon of old set upon the waters. And Babylon of old was brought down when the waters were diverted. Okay? When the Medes and the Persians diverted the waters that were going into Babylon, then they came in and they conquered the city of Babylon. And that Babylon is an illustration of modern Babylon. And here in Revelation 17, modern Babylon at the end of the world sets upon many waters. And when the papacy took its position in world history, it inherited the former Roman Empire. That took the city of Rome, and, and uh, it was Islam that prevented it from going any further than Europe. Islam wrapped itself around Catholicism, and it was confined to Europe. The, the, the territories of of pagan Rome. But when it inherited that territory, that territory had been divided into two parts in the year 330 by Constantine, Eastern Rome and Western Rome. So when Rome, Papal Rome, is portrayed as setting upon many waters, she sets upon Eastern Rome, the waters of the East, and Western Rome, the waters of the West. And the waters that came into the city of Babylon were what supported the city of Babylon, not only with drinking water, but with water to irrigate. Waters represent support. <coughs> what supported the papacy, but the waters that she was setting on are representing her support. When she was ruling the world, she was supported from not only Eastern Rome, but Western Rome. And in order for papal Rome in 1798 to be brought down, the support of Western Rome and Eastern Rome had to be dried up. And in the sixth trumpet, Islam of the sixth trumpet brought to an end Eastern Rome in 1453, and the waters of support for the whore of Rome was dried up. And in 1798, when Napoleon took the Pope captive and delivered the deadly wound, the waters of support of Western Rome were dried up. When both waters were dried up, the papacy received its deadly wound. So what I'm trying to suggest to you here is the, the history of the second woe connects, connects with many places in prophecy. And I have a couple more minutes. I'll give you a third line of prophecy to try to show you that both Islam and the dragon power are the powers that bring down modern Rome. Go to Revelation 17. The ten horns, which we have not identified, but the ten horns, brothers and sisters, is the dragon power of the United Nations, the ten kings that come into a church-state relationship with the papacy at the end of the world. And the reason they do so, and we're going to get to this, Lord willing, the reason that the papacy comes into a church-state relationship with the United Nations is because of Islam. Absolutely because of Islam. It's identified very specifically in Bible prophecy. But these ten horns, the United Nations, in verse 16 of Revelation 17, it says, and these ten horns, the United Nations, this is the dragon power, right? This is the dragon power. This is Satan. It's his earthly representative. It says, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So what I'm saying is, this is the dragon power at the end of the world, that's going to turn on the papacy. But in 1798, the dragon power of France turned on the papacy and dried up those waters. But 
with the papacy of old, not only were the western waters of the dragon tower in the west dried up, but the eastern waters were dried up, and they were dried up through the activities of Islam. And if you go to Revelation 18, which is describing what's just ahead, and you'll notice in verse 6, when it's talking about the punishment of the papacy, it says, reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she had filled, filled her double. So whatever her punishment is, it comes in double. And in verse 10 of Revelation 17, of Revelation 18, I'm sorry, in verse 10 of Revelation 18, describing the destruction of Babylon at the end, it says, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. The alas, the alas, I submit to you, is identifying her double punishment. And you'll notice in verse 16, it says, and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And in verse 19, <clears throat> It says, and they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. According to Revelation 17, uh, verse 16, the ten horns are going to burn her flesh, uh, burn her with fire and eat her flesh. But I would submit to you, that's the dragon power. But here in Revelation 18, when we're seeing her judgment illustrated a different way, the merchants of the earth are wailing because of her punishment, and what they're wailing is alas, alas, and this word that is translated alas here is found 61 or 67 times in the Bible, and it's only here in chapter 18 that it is translated as alas. Everywhere else, it's translated as it is in verse 13 of Revelation chapter 8. It's woe. So what they're saying here is woe, 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 woe. And the woes are pointing to the work of Islam in drying up the waters of the sport. And Revelation 17 is identifying the participation of the dragon power in drying up the waters of support for people alone with the end of the world, paralleling how people alone was brought down the first time, and how modern, how ancient Babylon was brought down in days of old. Islam is a subject of Bible prophecy. And on September 11, 2001, the third world began in history. And the pioneers believe that the third woe is identifying the events that lead to the return of Christ. And brothers and sisters, this, this is true. When you're hearing this for the first time, then you've never heard a more serious and solemn presentation in your life. Because it means that probation is about to close. And the things that are going on on planet Earth today only escalate and get worse. It means that Islam is just getting started. It's not done. And the natural disasters are only going to increase. And if we're holding on to a bunch of money in our savings account, we're going to be held accountable for not putting it into the Lord's work because you can see that the economy is folding up just like we've been forewarned. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of living in a time such as this, the time period that all the prophets desired to be in. That we need your forgiveness for living in this history and holding on to a lay of the same tradition that has prevented us from allowing you to fully use us to give the warning message that the planet Earth needs to hear at this time. We ask that you do what it takes to awaken us, give us the understanding that we need to give a warning message, and a message that draws people to the point where they desire nothing else but to have the experience of living and walking with you in their lives. 
We ask you to make that happen for each and every one in this room. We ask us a blessing upon this week that we're spending here considering these things. I ask that you put conviction upon the brothers and sisters here at heart to test these things that they're hearing. Confirm them and reject them based upon your word. <clears throat> Give them no rest until they do so, I ask in Jesus' name. Thank you.